Good evening. I'm Sigrid Schmalzer, a faculty member in the History Department here at UMass Amherst. I'd like to begin this event by acknowledging that our university community stands on Nanatuck land and to acknowledge neighboring indigenous nations, the Nipmuc and the Wampanoag to the east, the Mohegan and the Pequot to the south, the Mohican to the west, and the Abenaki to the north. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this Feinberg series panel discussion on disaster capitalism, ecofascism, and eco-authoritarianism with panelists Katya Aviles Vasquez, Rajni Batia, and John Aloysius Zinda. We invite you to listen to this event in Spanish and to view the live closed captioning. The Feinberg series is offered every other year by the Department of History at UMass Amherst, thanks to the generosity of alumnus Kenneth Feinberg and Associates. Titled Planet on a Precipice, this year's series seeks to deepen our understanding of the environmental emergency through historical analysis, and so help us to envision constructive paths forward. For more information about the series, to view recordings of past events, to register for future offerings, and to take a look at the list of more than three dozen community and university groups that partnered to make this event possible, please visit the Feinberg Series website. Now, when my colleague Kevin Young and I first sat down more than a year ago to brainstorm this event, he was haunted by the 2019 massacre in El Paso, which had been perpetrated by a white supremacist who subscribed to the belief that immigrants were fouling the natural environment and stealing natural resources from Americans. In short, Kevin was worried about ecofascism. Meanwhile, I was troubled by eco-authoritarianism. My field is modern Chinese history, so I have the opportunity on a regular basis to contemplate a big, powerful state further empowered by the specter of existential threat. But of course, that phenomenon is by no means foreign to us in the US. Think of the war on terror, that brainchild of US political leaders responsible for so much carnage around the world and for the intensification of surveillance at home. The same war on terror that has in turn given China's leadership the political legitimacy to suppress and incarcerate Muslim people in vast numbers. I found myself asking what kinds of horrors might follow a war on climate change waged by the US, China, or any other state. Juxtaposing ecofascism and eco-authoritarianism seemed important to both of us. And as we talked, we realized that the third threat we needed to address was that of capitalism, specifically disaster capitalism, when corporations seize the opportunity to transform stricken communities along the lines that will profit them the most to the detriment of local decision-making. As I said, that first conversation with Kevin happened more than a year ago. A lot has happened since then. As quickly as the climate catastrophe is descending on us, the pandemic and the nearly stolen election came still faster. And in the past year, we have all had more than a taste of the consequences of both inaction and bad action. What form of action will, uh, will come to address the environmental emergency? Will corporations seize opportunities to rebuild devastated communities? privatizing land and infrastructure in the process? Will political movements tap climate fears to promote exclusionary immigration policies and enact violent attacks on scapegoats? Will states exercise more authority to impose solutions without democratic process? Historically and today, ecological crisis has produced numerous such cases. Tonight, we are fortunate to have with us three scholars who can share their knowledge of examples from Latin America, Europe, the US and China Examples that open a wider discussion of the threats to and continued possibilities for democratic action on climate change. I'll be introducing our first speaker in just a minute, but before I do that, I want to alert you all to the web form that you can use to post questions for the speakers. The URL is posted on screen and in the YouTube and Facebook comments, uh, and you can post your questions at any time. We encourage you to do so as you think of them. My colleagues will be working to gather the questions and select a good assortment that will ensure all panelists have a chance to engage during the Q&A, which will happen after all the panelists have presented. So I'm now delighted to introduce our first panelist, Dr. Katya R. Aviles Vazquez. She is the director of the Institute for Research and Action in Agroecology in Puerto Rico. Dr. Aviles holds a PhD in geography from the University of Texas at Austin, where she studied the cultural and political ecology of small scale farmers in Puerto Rico. Her research highlights community based adaptations from a grassroots activism perspective. Her work and activism have been highlighted in local and international news outlets, including Democracy Now! and The Guardian. 
and she has received the EPA Environmental Champion Award and the ESF Graduate of Distinction Award. Please welcome Dr. Aviles. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you for this wonderful opportunity to share, learn, oh, standing by. Erica Lamino. Thank you, Erica. Um, thanks everyone for this wonderful opportunity to learn, share, and discuss such an important, such important topics together. I'm really excited and looking forward to hearing your presentations and feedback. In particular, thanks to Yvette Perfecto and Sigrid for reaching out and for the invitation to this and the wonderful support team, Helen, Jess, Erica, Kevin, for making tonight possible and all the people that I haven't met that have made this series possible. As um, Sigrid mentioned, I am Dr. Katia Aviles Vasquez, and Erica, I believe you can show the thank you. Uh, currently, I live and work in Puerto Rico, and if you listen, you maybe sound um, hear a sound in the background. Those are the coquis, little tree frogs. You're gonna see my cat running around in the background, and probably you're gonna hear my dog outside. So I live in the tropics; it's full of life. Um, a little bit of background on our territory is that it has been in possession by one empire or another for the past 500 years. 123 of them have been under U.S. rule and occupation. Actually, March 2nd, two days ago, marked the 104th anniversary of U.S. citizenship for Puerto Ricans, where the urban industrial transition took foothold in our economy precisely during this past century. So to go along some very, very basic concepts so that we can get into the discussion later, in this particular case, um, what is in what is capitalism? And this is just to show you how Uncle Sam was teaching and the there you have the entire Caribbean islands enjoying or being taught how to be civilized by Uncle Sam. This is from 1899, image from the POC. And then going to what is capitalism? So I have less than 15 minutes, so please bear with me. Oxford defines it as economic and political system in which a country's trade and industry are controlled by private owners for profit rather than by the state. So the common good and the public good is sacrificed to private benefit and individual profit. Now, how does that mix in with disaster capitalism? Naomi Klein explains, after a crisis, private contractors move in and suck up funding for work done badly, if at all, and then those billions get cut from the government budgets. So once again, you have public good and public needs being sacrificed or limited by those individual gains. So disaster capitalism takes advantage of people not being able to respond to the government's decision, whether it's because they're physically or emotionally unable to respond as a result of the disaster and pushes legislation, for example, the privatization of public infrastructure that would otherwise be unpalatable to, gener to the general public and a losing political gamble to any politician. It takes advantage of the shock that follows when your life is completely turned upside down. And that is precisely what happened to Puerto Ricans during those first two weeks of September, 2017. We faced a collapsed electric grid, no water service, no communications, and basically no government for months. However, Irma and Maria as natural events who did not hit an economically buoyant area or a neutral zone. They actually raised through a colony of the United States that separated, to quote one of your presidents, by a very big ocean with lots and lots of water. After her visit to Puerto Rico in 2017, Naomi Klein mentioned that she had never witnessed such a crude form of disaster capitalism as the government of Puerto Rico disappeared into non-action and U.S. private companies swooped in to carve out their share of the profits taken from the federal assigned budget. To understand why such a crude form manifested itself, we have to recognize the impacts of colonialism on subjugated bodies. Disaster capitalism converging where colonization has taken place is something that Villanueva and Covian had singled out about disaster, the concept of disaster capitalism. They state that unwittingly, talking about disaster capital, capitalism strictly obscures the history of the practices of privatization and individualism by focusing almost exclusively on what has happened after the disaster, in this case, hurricanes Irma and Maria, while obviating continuities inherited from the past. Yarimar Bonilla argues that what the disaster does 
is to deepen crisis, debt, and inequalities that were already happening in the landscape. As part of what she argues, Jarimar says that disaster capitalism needs to be understood, and I quote, as foundationally a form of racial colonial capitalism that emerges directly out of the capitalist incubator of plantation slavery. When Spain turned Puerto Rico over to the United States, the US set Puerto Rico on a path to become the Latin American counterweight to Cuba. Through openly violent and sometimes benevolently guised methods, the US empire purposefully changed the way Puerto Rico ate, lived, the way Puerto Ricans ate, lived, and saw themselves. Historically, the Hibar culture has been a sanctuary for cultural and material independence. And it's really important, McCune et al, when they first talk about disaster colonialism, talk about how the capacity to reproduce our own knowledge is one of, one of the essential features of the peasant agriculture that was happening under Spanish rule. Not that it was an utopia, but it had a basic capacity to produce the conditions upon which it depended. So an, an autonomous reproduction process became a source of stability and resilience for the Hibaro farmers, especially in the broader context in which markers are, markets are not a reliable source for creating positive benefits for independent farmers particularly as part of the shift on how we view ourselves, the Jibaro became equated with poverty, backwardness, dumbness, and because poverty is also seen as the result of not being able to manage your resources and having more population than the resources that you have available to you, then massive movements to sterilize women and tests on population control methods were carried out in Puerto Rico. And I'm sure, I'm sure Rajani is gonna talk a little bit about how that ecofascism plays out. This is a guidebook. And what's important about understanding disaster capitalism, and in this case, how it manifests on colonized landscapes, is that this guidebook, guidebook follows one economic experiment after the other. It went from the hacienda monoculture or the plantation slavery ideal that Jarimar Borina mentions to serve Spain, to then it was being replaced with electric power generation dependent on fossil fuel based on centrales where the ex sugarcane exploited lands were and onto racialized populations within the islands of the Caribbean and then to industrial production in those very scarred landscapes and bodies. Through the world systems theory lens of Wallerstein, the Janbury argues that peasant farmers subsidized this disarticulated economies. Thus, the plantation economy basically allowed for the reproduction of those means of survival. And the industrial experiments substituted those subsidies by the dominant power. So the entirety of the control of the means of production shifted from being able and knowing how to work the land to dispossessing people from the land and being in control of the dominant empire. In this way, in order to prove, if this was done in order to prove and anchor capitalism and making sure that it showed it worked and could be integrated to boost the success of this particular social experiment. By 1996, the subsidies and incentives that were part of Operation Bootstrap in 1947, the, ex the economic experiment of industrialization in Puerto Rico, were gonna be, start, the announcement came that they were gonna be rolled back and the economic crash began. At first, the Puerto Rican government was able to mask the declining revenue by increasing its public bonds or loans. Puerto Rico bonds were at the time considered a triple threat as there was no municipal, state, or federal tax. Yet another type of subsidy of hoarding public money or public goods into private hands and private profit. It was not until 2016 that this became absolutely untenable. Obama signed PROMESA into law as a way to forbid the Puerto Rican government, avoid the Puerto Rican government from being able to declare bankruptcy and impose, excuse me, impose an oversight board that controls every single decision that the government in Puerto Rico can make. It also has the power to wholesale our territory and sacrifice our people to the altar of private capital. The control board imposed draconian austerity measures, which included or directly led to the lack of maintenance of public infrastructure, school closures, among others. And this is just some images of the oversight board and its composition and a child in front of a closed school. The empire had been grooming its servants for centuries now. The local ruling elite had been established and was now completely assimilated and subservient more than to capital, more than to a particular empire state, to capital itself. It is in this context 
in holding the superiority of the US and in rejecting the knowledge, the local based knowledge that Hurricanes Irma and Maria enter Puerto Rico. In the aftermath, government officials are holed up in conditioned convention center, in the convention center with air conditioning, hanging out and handing out million dollar contracts to their government friends and allies. Newly created US companies receive million dollar contracts, international firms are recognized over local firms, and people from the US are hired to manage the disaster, creating private public partnerships in order to bypass local, local institutions and guidelines that were made, meant to safeguard the public good. Hotel rooms were rented out, private contractors were sitting at hotel bars waiting for work while the Puerto Ricans starved. Overpriced basic resources, even plastic orange cones, at a five were sold at $500 a piece as basic necessities. To cite a friend, they set out the card game to play amongst themselves. And one such example was Tuoga Renace, which charged huge amounts of daily labor, paying a pittance to local workers, as Klein would have defined it already in disaster capitalism. However, police abuse and human rights abuses became even more rampant, documented by Anel Martinez, among many other fabulous women and an excellent team of researchers, in which two years later, with still thousands of people without homes and without roof, a chat comes out publicly where the governor and his squad make fun of Maria's death toll. The shock of the year with two energies subsides under the anger of that public, the publicity of that chat. So Puerto Ricans, we took to the streets in this, what's called the summer of 2019, as you can see here. But interestingly enough, while that one person was being ousted at that moment, the, the ex-governor Ricardo Rosselló, disaster capitalism and capitalism creates the conditions to perpetuate itself. The government continued behind that one person that received all the ire, business as usual, and created a new, new public policy to change land classifications that would have permitted increased sales to private hands and loss of land protections to ease construction and immersion of foreign capital into Puerto Rico while pushing out Puerto Ricans from the island. Year 2020 became the supersized combo meal of disasters in Puerto Rico. By the end of 2019, an earthquake swarm became active in the Southwest. And in January 2020, two major earthquakes rattled the island, leading to yet another round of blackouts, water, and communication shortages. It was in this context then that the COVID pandemic starts, followed by drought and storms once again that further deepened the crisis for most residents. An archipelago that has had three years of constant upheavals as if, as if nature itself was against us. Rivera proposes the concept of disaster colonialism to explain how procedural vulnerability is deepened through disasters and subsequently leveraged to deepen coloniality. A government drunk with power which distributed contracts in the millions for US crews trained to take money off of one disaster after another with none or very little going to the people, once again seeks out a magic bullet to solve the economic crisis. In this case, the course of privatization and sale of the land by public-private partnerships like the now experimented DMO where you see here the current um, president of the board as well while selling the island to tourists or to new millionaires, living standards for Puerto Ricans keep dropping. The designation of over 90% of the archipelago of Puerto Rico as an opportunity zone, which is an unprecedented um, event, is a huge amount of the territory, and laws or Act 2022 became another tax, ex tax exemption scheme for millionaires, which have already attracted thousands of people to specific enclaves in Puerto Rico only for millionaires and that have little or no financial or social responsibility beyond their gated communities and private schools. Close to 20 billion have been approved for the disaster funding of which the majority received so far has gone to US companies. And the amount received has been much less than what was expected. Puerto Rico is being converted into a Bitcoin paradise with millionaires buying the territory piecemeal. Meanwhile, the roofs are still not repaired. The funding for reconstruction of schools impacted by the earthquakes 
has not appeared or disappeared like the supplies after the, the hurricane. And million dollar contracts were again given to companies that did not exist or had newly been created for testing COVID and distributing by vaccines and materials that would not be available years after the contract was executed. Currently, they're both forcing the reopening of schools which have not yet recovered from the earthquakes without input from the teachers, parents, and students on how to control, minimize risk, and address all the different disasters that are coming together in contained specific geographical spaces. Ayuda Legal in December of 2020 developed or finished a study that highlights that the majority of the repairs that have been approved so far were for housing that had a much higher value than those that truly needed repairs. And new, that this new economic experiment is being pushed with solar farms taking up whatever farmland is left, completing then the cycle of leaving Puerto Ricans without food, without housing, and without land. All of this points to what we have been discussing, that the disaster is by design lethal for specific bodies. Garcia, Gustavo Garcia, in response to Yamiria Marbonilla states that this dynamics of govern, governing life and death are part of the structural conditions that make non-natural disasters, disaster events, such as hurricanes, floods, and earthquakes, much more damaging to those colonized and racialized subjects. It is the government structure and the colonized mentality that is opening the way for profits gaining a new dimension. It is, it is, if not, it is not just the threat to the public goods or the common infrastructure, but the disappearance of our very bodies from the landscape, at which point our government, as well as other Latin American governments have referred to these disasters as a clean slate for rich investments. Now, what is scary about the juxtaposition of an economic setting with colonial ties and climate crisis of those colonized spaces and bodies is that we become more vulnerable to those extreme events, facing them even more than those that cause the climate emergency. More frequent and stronger over and over the same script playing out with profound impact on those settings. Puerto Rico, Barbuda, Bahamas, and now the case of Central America in the Mestizo frontier, advanced where, where the Mestizo frontier is advancing onto areas that have centuries of resistance by Garifuna and indigenous peoples, becoming yet another clean slate. And the image on the right that you see there is precisely an image from the Eastern coast of Central America, removing housing, food, and ultimately again, erasing us from that landscape. It is removing those undesirable bodies that do not benefit capitalism to be substituted in the long game for more desirable, palatable, and useful bodies for capital. We need to flip the script and create new mechanisms that recognize autonomy and independence, that build and reproduce their own, our own methods of production, restore and regenerate the earth, and reclaim that cultural knowledge that has been that has been that is being lost, particularly through reparations, not charity, and against parachute NGOs that absorb international funding the same way that disaster capitalists do, but with a nonprofit front. In this case, we need to recognize the disproportionate impact that colonized lands have, have had to bear and the public service that ancestral cultures provided as redundancy measures for survival recognize when the disaster is being used to further a political agenda and the economic system and supporting organizations that are truly working to halt that progress. I would be remiss if I didn't mention organizations like Ofrané in Honduras that are working directly with Garifuna indigenous populations, Jornada, Comedores Sociales, Agitarte, and the Centros de Apoyo Mutuo here in Puerto Rico that have been working through international allies that grass like Grassroots International avoiding parachute NGOs from coming in and devouring a lot of the structural funding that is so needed and the local development that is needed here. So in the end, my message to you is, we are living history now and the fight is for survival. The elimination of our indigenous peoples and our ancestral cultures was not just 500 years ago, but it is happening right now. The aftermath of current and future disasters is being used to militarize areas, erase our bodies, and as Rivera says, to further coloniality. 
private control and coloniality and private control over our common future. And that is the real disaster, racial colonial capitalism, triple bottom line. Thank you. Thank you so much, Katya, for that very powerful presentation. Um, we see the questions are already pouring in and I wanna remind everyone in the audience that you can continue to post any questions that come up uh, for previous speakers or current speakers um, in, the, uh, in that Google form uh, and the URL will be posted on the screen and in um, the Facebook and uh, YouTube chat. Um, so I would like to now introduce uh, the next speaker Professor Rajani Bhatia, who is Associate Professor of Women's, Gender and Sexuality Studies at the University at Albany. A scholar activist within women's health and reproductive justice movements, Professor Bhatia has contributed to feminist analysis of global population control, right-wing environmentalism, coercive practices and unethical testing related to contraceptive and sterilization technologies, both inside and outside the US. She is co-editor of a themed section of Gender, Place, and Culture, challenging scholarship that links population reduction with climate change adaptation and mitigation and the survival of the planet. And she is author of Gender Before Birth, Sex Selection in a Transnational Context. Please welcome Professor Bhatia. Thank you so much, Sigrid. I am grateful for the invitation to this event and thank the organizers, Jess Johnson, Kevin Young, and Sigrid Schmaltzer for the opportunity and the support from Erica and Helen as well. I will be speaking primarily about ecofascism in the US, a topic that I arrived at through feminist critiques of population control, particularly through the influence and inspiration of Betsy Hartman, who has called it the greening of hate. We were both part of a small feminist group active in the 90s and early 2000s called the Committee on Women, Population, and the Environment. Our broad multifaceted program included issues ranging from exposing coercive contraception pra practices to racist environmentalisms. For today's talk, I will be, sorry, my slides are not moving. Let me see if I can, uh, okay, get that to, Oop, there we go. There we go. Um, yeah, there we go. Sorry. Uh, for today's talk, I will draw primarily from my chapter, Green or Brown, White Nativist Environmental Movements, which was published in 2004 as part of an anthology titled Homegrown Hate. But first, a word on the title. The color referred to the Nazi paramilitary uniform known as the brown shirts. It should not be confused with the usage of of Brown in Ann Coulter's 2017 opinion piece titled, Choose Between a Green America and a Brown America, in which the American conservative media pundit berated, in her words, the environmental damage being done by hundreds of thousands of Latin American Can you all hear me? Okay. Um, sorry, it looks like the internet just uh, went out there. So my argument it was that environmentalism is not politically neutral and that it is therefore, um, that it be therefore behooves us to analyze the politics of environmental movements or risk abetting right-wing advances. We were fresh off struggles within the Sierra Club where a measure to call for net reductions in immigration was narrowly defined
All right, my apologies. Can you all hear me? Um, okay, so, um, so our primary concern at that time um, was with the potential for advances of anti-immigrant ideologies disguised, disguised in a refrain commonly heard among environment, mainstream environmental groups that linked population increases to environmental degradation. We had evidence that this was an explicit strategy made by the white nativist environmental organizations known as the Tanton Network. More on that later. Alarmist rhetoric on population was cropping up into mainstream environmental media. And wittingly or not, several mainstream groups primarily working on land and wildlife protection and restoration seemed susceptible to embracing the lobby's messaging. So our aim at that time was to warn environmentalists about a wolf's in sheep's clothing, never anticipating how mainstream that wolf or hate itself would become. So I'd like to sketch for you a few ongoing concerns we raised at that time and then turn to more recent effects in both mainstream and extreme sites to think through what the current shifting political context means in terms of political priorities for fighting ecofascism. So part of our educational goals at that time were to point to a tradition of reactionary ecology. Peter Stoudenmeyer, in a 1995 article titled Eco, uh, Fascist Ecology, described the romanticization of rural life and an imagined exceptional relationship between German soil and German people in the 19th century as indicated in the famous phrase, Blut und Boden, or blood and soil. In fact, the German zoologist Ernst Haeckel, who termed the word ecology and other leading figures of this ideology at the time, were ardent anti-Semites, anti-urban, and proponents of social Darwinist and eugenic ideas. A half century later, Nazi ideologues posited an exclusive, even mystical connection of the German people to the land or environment. Not only were Germans thought to have a higher propensity than others to care for the environment, but the mere presence of the superior race was thought to enhance rather than degrade it. It's important to remember that these views translated into policy and action that seem familiarly environmental. The Nazis institutionalized and spread methods of organic farming, established the first ecological preservation sites in Europe, and implemented programs of reforestation and animal and plant species protection. They also promoted ecologically responsible industrial development and technology. The 1935 Reich Naturschutzgesetz, Nature Protection Law, an accomplishment of Nazi ecologists, established rules of special protection for flora, fauna, and undeveloped lands. The same Nazi belief system simultaneously conceived a population in the context of a social Darwinist struggle between races for survival and power. The, they viewed population as an aggressive force, a means by which races compete against each other to occupy and control space and land. They depicted population pressures from Eastern Europe as a threat to German Lebensraum or living space. Current right wing discourse on the environment in the US and Europe portrays the presence of immigrants in similar ways as a threat to American culture or Western civilization. Maintaining this idea of population as a hostile force by which one group gener generatively competes against another. Across the Atlantic, the US had its own influential supporters, notably John Muir, Madison Grant, and Theodore Roosevelt in the early 20th century, who were key proponents of eugenics, cons conservationism, and an exclusionary wilderness ethic. Mir, who founded the Sierra Club in 1892, wanted Native Americans, whom he found unclean, removed from Yosemite. Teddy Roosevelt, who is often remembered for establishing national parks, simultaneously appealed to white women to prevent race suicide by having more children. Madison Grant's 1916 book, The Passing of the Great Race, articulates the demographic anxiety at the heart of white nativist environmentalisms. Nearly 100 years later, Grant's book is still praised by active white supremacist groups. And this brings me to the politics of population control. 
volumes have been written about the politics of international population control in the middle of the 20th century, when governance on demographic futures became an indicator for responsible statehood and a precondition for receiving foreign aid. Anxieties about global so-called overpopulation and the Earth's finite so-called carrying capacity that motivated these policies became part of mainstream and liberal discourse. The influential 1968 bestseller, Paul Ehrlich's The Population Bomb, an ar and article by Garrett Hardin the same year, The Tragedy of the Commons, heralded a new period of alarmism about the supposed impending collapse of the planet connected to anxieties around resource scarcity. 50 years after it was written, Tragedy of the Commons is one of the most assigned essays in college courses, according to the Open Syllabus Project, and TED Ed and the Khan Academy have animated videos on it. Hardin's Competitive Exclusion Principle, published in Science in 1960, holds that in a resource finite environment, two different populations fighting over the same resources cannot stably coexist. One will win out. Ideas such as these were always presented as unchanging laws of nature. The global overpopulation crisis as taken up by the mainstream produced images of illiterate, poor, dark-skinned masses breeding indiscriminately to the point where they would spill beyond their country's borders. As population control was increasingly invoked and implemented in the name of the environment, reproductive rights, and for the sake of assisting poor countries towards development, the groundwork was laid for funneling reactionary ideas into a liberal agenda. So I shift here from the establishment of a massive population control lobby to the green nativist lobby. During the 1980s and increasingly in the 90s, a new right-wing environmental lobby focusing on the US emerged. It produced a particularly reactionary take on the population and environment link common in mainstream discourse that pointed to an urgent need to control global population growth. The assertion population growth is a primary cause of environmental degradation unleashed nativist impulses in defense of an exclusionary idea of American culture and heritage. The leader of the Green Nativist Network in the US was John Tanton, who has been described by the Southern Poverty Law Center as the founding father of America's modern anti-immigration movement. Active in the National Audubon Society and the Sierra Club in the 60s and 70s, Tanton later founded, funded, and otherwise aided in establishing 13 anti-immigrant organizations. These range from organizations whose statement of purpose is mainly on population and environment issues, such as Caring Capacity Network, Population and Environment Balance, and Negative Population Growth, to immigration reform organizations that use environmental arguments, such as Federation for American Immigration Reform, Center for Immigration Studies, and Project USA, to those designated as hate groups by the Southern Poverty Law Center. Tanton also funded English-only organizations such as U.S. English and Pro-English. Other prominent individuals in the right-wing environment lobby included Garrett Hardin, Virginia Abernathy, Kevin McDonald, J. Philip Rushton, and Richard Lynn. Many of them contributed to the academic journal Population and Environment or engaged in network organizations, which received funding from the Skay Family Foundations and the Pioneer Fund under, uh, among others, the, the Pioneer Fund also funded, um, supported eugenics research. When I wrote about the greening of hate in 2004, I could not have imagined the extent to which white nationalism would make its way to the presidential administration via Donald Trump. Trump advisors and appointees like Jeff Sessions, Kellyanne Conway, and Stephen Miller, as well as the Department of ha Homeland Security, Citizenship, and Immigration Services Ombudsman are linked to the Tanton Network. They arrived at unprecedented policy influence with an agenda that included um, mil militarizing the US-Mexico border, uh, criminalizing all immigration, prohibiting visas from seven to eventually 13 largely Muslim countries, ending DACA, zero tolerance policies, uh, requiring the arrest of anyone caught crossing the border illegally, ending DACA. Um, and, and as if these weren't despicable enough, separating children from their parents. 
Although these measures were carried out without environmental justification, a Tantide, Tantan allied group called Progressive for Immigration Reform called on Trump in October 2019 to create a new bureau within the EPA with jurisdiction over immigration and naturalization to study the impact of population growth on the environment. The appeal stated, Mr. President, other administrations have failed to study population growth's impact on our natural resources and treasures. You are presented with an opportunity to create an environmental legacy, not just for you, but for generations of Americans. Remember, economic prosperity isn't the sole measure of a president's success. Part of making America great again is making it green again. So what happens when Tandon's network once a, a disreputable faction of right-wing politics becomes populist and goes mainstream, the extreme goes even further. While my comments till now have mainly centered on the US, I'd like to cite some troubling examples of eco-fascist violence occurring globally. In 2011, Anders Breivik killed 77 leftist youth in Norway. His manifesto declared, we should create population capacity guidelines for continents or countries. If starvation threatens the countries who have failed to follow our guidelines, we should not support them by backing their corrupt leaders or send any form of aid. There is no general consensus to the carrying capacity of the planet. Our planet should not exceed 3 billion individuals, so radical policies will have to be implemented. In 2017, Richard Spencer, leader of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville, cited protection of the environment as a main reason for the mobilization. In March 2019, in Christchurch, New Zealand, Brenton Tarrant walked into two mosques, killing 51 people. Here are some excerpts from his manifesto. It's the birth rates, it's the birth rates, it's the birth rates. The environment is being destroyed by overpopulation. We Europeans are one of the groups that are not overpopulating the world. The invaders are the ones overpopulating the world. Kill the invaders, kill the overpopulation, and by doing so, save the environment. In August 2019, as already mentioned, in El Paso, Texo, Texas, Patrick Crucius killed 22 people in a Walmart in response to what he called the Hispanic invasion. His manifesto stated, and I'll just um, read this one excerpt because it sounds so much like uh, what would come out of a mainstream or even uh, left-leaning environmental organization. Our lifestyle is destroying the environment of our country. The decimation of the environment is creating a massive burden for future generations. Corporations are heading the, de the destruction of our environment by shamelessly harvest over-harvesting resources. And then of course he goes on to say that population reduction is also, is, is, is almost the low hanging fruit. Etc. Um, the in, um, on, online ecofascist Im imagery and language abounds on Twitter and Achan, for example, via the hashtag Pine Tree Gang. There are Lorax memes purporting to speak for the trees and favored phrases such as bees, not refugees. In the context of the current administration, which does not espouse hate and has recognized the need to address climate change urgently, we must address issues on both the right and the left. On the right, we must recognize that conservative youth are more likely to reject climate denialism than older conservatives. The European New Right, for example, advocates for climate action and anti-immigration policies. Even Fox News, which normally sticks to strict climate denialism, recently aired a viewpoint that considered the hypothetical possibility of climate change in order to double down on their anti-immigrant stance, claiming that allowing immigrants from lower carbon emitting countries into the US where they would become higher carbon emitters would be counterproductive. As we face more climate catastrophes, hotter weather, intense wildfires, uh, violent hurricanes and decreasing disaster resources, we may see power vacuums in federal responses filled by the far right who stoke Antifa and Jewish conspiracies on their origins. The Oath Keepers, an anti-government militia movement, which I'm sure you've all heard of, um, has organized disaster response, uh, response to floods, tornadoes, and wildfires in order to provide people with food and water, clear roads, and help with rescue missions. On the left, we should be on the lookout for the use of alarmist rhetoric and numbers by liberal environmental groups used to drum up support for climate action. 
dire predictions such as an, such as an off-sited estimate of 1 billion climate refugees expected to arrive north by 2050 are not unlike those from the alarmist population bomb era. They fail to account for the complexities of migration, including the ways that climate displacements have been occurring for a long time, prompting movements mostly within rather than across national borders. We need to also watch out for old school population alarmism. Recently, a group of bioethicists defended even coercive measures of what they called population engineering as morally justified in averting harms related to climate change. In addition, populationist discourses increasingly invoke the language of social justice and self-identify as progressive or liberal. For all these reasons, we have to think carefully about how to address the urgency of climate change and other pressing environmental issues without driving right-wing alarmist rhetoric. It is important to give people potential solutions and reasons to be hopeful, lest we drive the same sorts of apocalypticism that has mainstreamed hate and motivated extreme violence. We need to keep an eye out for the increased networking of white nativist environmental movements globally. And I would add, be alert to the potential of an expansion of eco-fascist ideas, even among non-white nativists in the context of right-wing populisms espoused all over the world. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Rajani, for um, handling those technical difficulties so well and giving us so much to think about. Um, I know the um, questions are coming in, and I want to encourage people to keep posting those questions um, to the URL that is uh, appears on the bottom of your screen and in the um, chat for YouTube and Facebook. Um, so I will now introduce our third and final speaker. Professor John Zinda is Assistant Professor in the Department of Global Development at Cornell University. An environmental sociologist, he studies how people create, struggle over, and sometimes resolve environmental concerns. Much of his work has examined how people and landscapes in rural China respond to developmental and environmental interventions around new national parks, afforestation, and agricultural livelihoods. He also examines how people respond to changing flood risk in the United States. His work has appeared in World Development, The China Quarterly, Society and Natural Resources, Geoforum, Rural Sociology, Human Ecology, and the Journal of Peasant Studies. Please welcome Professor Zinda. Thank you so much. Uh, and apologies for not for not unmuting. Um, thank you so much, uh, Sigrid. And also, I'd like to echo um, Dr. Bhatia and thanking um, both the organizers and all of the staff members whose labor has made this conversation possible. Um, I'm really humbled to be uh, uh, part of this conversation in, in such powerful company. Um, so today I'm going to share some work uh, that I've been doing engaging with the complexities of what uh, many have come to call authoritarian environmentalism. So this paper originated in field work that I was doing in southwestern China, where I was working with landscape ecologists to understand how and why different communities that implemented a reforestation program saw very different outcomes. The negotiations and compromises we observed diverge a great deal from common pictures of authoritarian environmental governance. So I drew on this work and also dug into a lot of other scholars' insightful examinations of various domains of environmental concern in China to draw what I hope will be a clearer picture of authoritarian environmentalism. In a book titled The Collapse of Western Civilization, Naomi Oreskes and Eric Conway present a sobering history of the Anthropocene from 200 years on. Catastrophic climate change and geoengineering backfires have wrecked countries and slaughtered billions. The narrator, a citizen of what they call the Second People's Republic of China, recounts how democratic institutions hobbled by neoliberalism failed to address the crisis. Authoritarian China, with its strong central government, mobilized people and resources to cope and persist. These authors joined a host of other scholars and commentators who have argued that in the face of super wicked problems posed by climate change and other environmental problems, 
Only authoritarian states will have the fortitude to take decisive actions that threaten many subjects' immediate interests. Seemingly in direct response to such claims, ruling authorities in the People's Republic of China have made massive investments in environmental protection and remediation, from the world's largest reforestation effort to a new effort for protected areas, a new framework for protected areas, to unequaled investments in renewable energy, to dramatic reductions in air pollution in major cities. The Chinese Communist Party and its agents in the state have articulated a vision of lands and waters managed to yield natural health and beauty, economic plenty, social welfare, and national strength. They call it ecological civilization. We might note that there are definitely strong flavors of green nativism, analogous to the kinds that we just uh, heard about. In this vision, the biophysical world is inescapably shaped by human hands, and the way to save ecology and humanity, both, is through coordinated management overseen by a paternalistic state. One challenge in discussions about authoritarian environmentalism is that many people are not clear on what they mean when they say authoritarian. Some focus on the presence and quality of elections, ignoring that elections are only one of the many institutions involved in making rulers responsive to the ruled. Others accept that authoritarianism is more than lack of elections, but remain imprecise on what differentiates more or less authoritarian contexts. To ground my discussion, I draw on uh, Marlies Glazius' 20, uh, essay from 2018 on the topic in international affairs. Glazius states, I define authoritarian practices as patterns of actions that sabotage accountability to people over whom a political actor exerts control or their representatives by means of secrecy, disinformation, and disabling voice. These are distinct from illiberal practices, which refer to patterned and organized infringements of individual autonomy and dignity." End quote. Authoritarian practices may be undertaken by any body with, uh, with authority over affairs that affect people, from transnational organizations to community councils. And we've seen particular sorts of authoritarian practices in um, the discussions before about disaster capitalism and ecofascism. Across scholarship on authoritarian environmental governance, three core critiques emerge. The first is that authoritarian environmental governance is unjust. This is for the same reason that authoritarian rule is unjust in general. In authoritarian rule, subjects do not play directly in decisions about how they're governed, and rulers tend to pursue goals other than those that broadly advance human flourishing. I accept this moral critique, though I note that the practical tensions presented by unaccountable real-world democratic institutions and potential trade-offs of suffering and environmental catastrophe need serious attention. Two practical critiques also emerge in varied forms. One is that authoritarian environmental governance is rigid. When rulers realize the power to simplify societies and ecologies in the interests of production and administration, their rigid practices clash with irreducible socio-ecological complexity. Um, Dan Shahar has argued that regimes that suppress accountability and quash dissent lose the feedback that's essential to effective governance, and hence their efforts are going to tend to fail. These claims run athwart a growing body of literature showing that authoritarian regimes can be quite flexible strategically. They work not just through coercion, but through co-optation, negotiation, hegemony. They selectively engage subjects to identify pressure points. Scholars have termed these patterns responsive authoritarian or bargained authoritarianism. In a similar vein, Emily Ye, Sarah Rogers, Janet Sturgeon, Genia Kostka, and many others have shown in China through sustained work with people involved in environmental projects that state projects often don't play out the way policy statements suggest. Authoritarian governance is incomplete. The authoritarian state is complicated, internally divided across locales and domains, externally involved in cross-cutting relationships with many other actors. Local resistance may thwart central goals. Poorly aimed interventions may backfire. The center may revise its plans. Important questions arise. To what extent are these deviations from plans bugs or features of the system? We can think of them as exciting resistance. We can also see how they fit into strategies of responsive authoritarian governance. In these discussions, we often find ourselves stranded between the broad generalizations of authoritarian environmentalism proponents and the hyperspecificity of case studies that rightly draw our attention to the complexities of state-society interactions in place. 
These latter studies often bring their own broad generalizations without examining how things play out across different situations. We might get a clearer grasp of what goes on in authoritarian environmental governance by synthesizing work across different domains and time periods. I drew from published work on environmental governance across many domains in China, including my own field work, as well as ideas from James Scott's book, Seeing Like a State, How Certain Schemes to Improve the Human Condition Have Failed. The linchpin of Scott's argument is that simplistic governance is self-defeating and that modern states, um, sorry, and that is inherent to, to the authoritarian state to simplify. Scott's cases amply demonstrate that modern states tend toward authoritarianism and where states make vast and rigid simplifications trouble brews. China's ecological civilization projects seem made to match Scott's framework, these vast projects trying to engineer environments and society to do what the state wants. But what we have learned about incompleteness and flexibility in authoritarian rule raises some questions about this. What if rulers learned a different lesson from the 20th century fail failures? What if rather than to retreat and make way for a world governed by Metis and local knowledge, they found that achieving their aims and staying in power required adapting in the face of social and environmental resistance. When we look at environmental governance in China over the past three decades, we can detect shifts away from the ideology and practices that Scott characterized. First, from maximizing to optimizing. Instead of maximizing a single output, party state authorities seek to optimize across multiple values that go beyond productivism. So we're no longer just trying to get as, most, as much grain, timber, or GDP as we can out of the land. Environmental values gain priority for their own sake, or at least are recognized as vital to other priorities in a connected and dynamic way. From thin simplifications to thicker ones. In Scott's account, planners reduce a landscape to the things they must see in order to maximize the outputs they want. Uh, they remove other things as they can and act like the rest are not there. Policy statements and practices in China increasingly incorporate complexity. As all models are, these visions are still simplifications, but more fine-grained and dynamic. From rigidity to constrained complex flexibility, ecological civilization schemes leave room for adjusting to unanticipated conditions. Complex system thinking that incorporates feedback and uncertainty has replaced an ideology of total control. This flexibility has limits defined by the priority of maintaining regime control. And last, from coercion to negotiation, Authorities de-emphasize, but certainly do not eliminate coercive measures and increase emphasis on coaxing human conduct on the basis of continually updated understandings of their subjects' wants and concerns. To get a clear sense of what these shifts do, we need to examine concrete instances. This also keeps our eyes on difference and division within the state and among its subjects and environments that it re regulates. So I'll start with optimizing. In 2010, the State Council of the People's Republic of China issued the National Outline for Principal Function Zones. This document presents a scheme for dividing up China's territory based on different areas' capacities to serve industrial, agricultural, and environmental purposes. These efforts at environmental zoning typify Chinese authorities' preoccupation with optimizing. Mapping underpins land use quotas, which would seem to be a maximizing approach, but these designations unleashed negotiations among central, provincial, and local actors, often bringing adjustments. Local officials' criteria for advancement have also changed, with economic indicators de-emphasized and environmental ones elevated. Principal function zoning is no panacea. Nevertheless, it contrasts starkly with past land management approaches that cordoned environmental, agricultural, and industrial spheres off from one another, and subordinated environmental goals to increasing economic output. By institutionalizing a more complex view of socio-ecological relationships, the shift from maximization to optimization may enable party state actors to recognize and incorporate concerns that they once disregarded. To incorporate additional values, planners must thicken their simplifications. If agriculture is not only about raising economic output, but also ensuring domestic provision of strategic crop, crops, maintaining soil fertility, and preventing social unrest, then the state's lenses for viewing farms have to take all of these things into account. Examining a state-facilitated shift from grain to potato cultivation in the arid northwest of China, Afton Clark Sather has written, 
state actors direct regulation of nature by providing irrigation water has been replaced by government regulation of drought by means of climatic adaptation going with nature in the seasons and enrolling agriculture into ever expanding circuits of material circulation close quote another telling case is the proliferation of walnut trees in south china's southwestern mountains where i have worked for boosters perennial crops offer not just high value produce and roots holding down soil, but stable supplies of strategic commodities and a boon for building processing industries. Walnuts seem an ideal choice because local inhabitants have grown them for hundreds of years and might draw on local knowledge in their cultivation. This thickening of simplifications has enabled new crops to proliferate and tempered effects that more fully commodified crop booms have brought elsewhere. <laughs> While agricultural initiatives continue to push industrialization, policies stipulate crop rotations, fallow cycles, and controls on synthetic inputs. Such actions fall short of the richness of smallholder polycultures, but by working with complexity, they may make agriculture in China more resilient. Now constrained flexibility. State authorities have moved from unbending demands to using rules and negotiations to keep systems in manageable states. They allow markets to function as a buffer against scarcities and gluts. These flexibilities are not absolute. Nonetheless, environmental management in China today is a far cry from the rigidity of authoritarian high modernism. Returning, the Returning Farmland to Forest Program, or RFFP, shows how Chinese state authorities attempt to resolve tensions by tweaking and repackaging interventions. The program's central aim was to reduce soil erosion by paying farmers to retire erosion-prone farmland and plant trees thereupon. In many cases, farmers resisted. Authorities sometimes buckled down, but also made the RFFP more flexible. Restrictions on interplanting field crops were lifted. Poverty alleviation, alternative energy development, and job training became central to the policy. Party state agents adapted in the face of tensions. Pollution management highlights both flexibility and constraint. Facing widespread smog, China's uh, rulers have declared a war on pollution. Centralized oversight, binding targets, and unannounced inspections bespeak tightening control. Yet, as Genia Kostka writes, China's target-based environmental management approach also permits far more flexibility than one might assume. When targets are passed down the administrative hierarchy, local bureaucrats often tailor them to regional circumstances. In addition, the occurrence of crises or unforeseen problems can trigger adjustment of targets." End quotation. These flexibilities have limits. Where core policy priorities, national security, or social unrest come into question, coercion prevails. This is not a, necessarily a pretty picture. Still, within such constraints, environmental management efforts in China are flexible in their goals and means. Party state authorities have also shifted from coercive measures to coaxing human conduct. They invite members of the public to participate in environmental programs and express concerns about environmental issues while suppressing actions that might prove disruptive. The South to North Water Transfer Project looks like the epitome of an authoritarian high modernist scheme. Dams, tunnels, canals, and pumping stations move water from the Yangtze watershed to the parched north, driving involuntary relocations and privileging some re regions over others. Yet, as Sarah Rogers, Michael Weber, and others have shown, the project's builders deal in persuasion and exchange more than coercion. Authorities co-opt potential opponents with compensation payments and lucrative projects. They strengthen the project discursively by tying it into the national environmental destiny expressed in visions of ecological civilization. I am arguing not that authoritarian environmentalism is something we should rally around, but that it has greater staying power than many have suggested, and its unevenness contributes to this staying power. Instead of trying to steamroll nature, the party state is addressing it dynamically, sometimes accommodating, sometimes engineering, always manipulating, but also always taking biophysically constraints seriously. Looking ahead, rather than catastrophic failure, perhaps we are more likely to see managed tensions. The responsive authoritarian character of China's schemes, and I don't want you, this to be construed as uh, responsive in a sense of fully, uh, fully accountable, but rather selectively responsive to things that raise tensions for the state. This responsive authoritarian character tempers the most destructive tendencies of authoritarian high modernism. Still, the simplification, drive for control, and neglect of complexity that Scott critiques are only tempered. They're not absent. 
Another thing I'm not argu arguing is that China has seen a wholesale movement to the right end of all of these axes. Some areas, like forest management, seem to have moved further than others. Forcible shutdowns of polluting enterprises show moves in the opposite direction. We can learn a lot by examining under what circumstances these shifts take place and with what implications. This picture draws from China's experience, but it may illuminate other cases of authoritarian environmentalism, or perhaps environmental governance in general. After all, Scott's argument was that all states have authoritarian tendencies. Both looking at nation-state cases and comparing different policy domains and locales within countries, we can characterize environmental governance by how far it differs from authoritarian high modernism on these four dimensions, and we can look at how the nature of an environmental issue, social context, and outcomes relate to these variations. Of course, this framework is never going to tell the whole story, and for that, there's no substitute for digging into specific situations and their consequences. Oreskes and Conway present not an endorsement of authoritarianism, but a warning that democracies must grapple with climate change before it brings catastrophes that overwhelm democratic institutions. In their account, blinded by neoliberal ideology and scientific conservatism, neoliberal regimes fail on the environment because they're not adequately democratic. Environmental improvements are hollow if they coexist with exposure of the poor to contamination, suppression of popular concerns, or concentration camps holding minority populations. Authoritarian environmentalism may prove robust to shocks, but getting to just and lasting environmental governance will require something anathema to eco-modernists, authoritarian and liberal alike. Inclusive social movements joined around a political program of equity and environmental integrity. Um, thank you all for uh, taking the time to listen to me, and I uh, look forward to joining a, a lively conversation afterward. Thank you so much, John, for that very rich presentation. Uh, well, we clearly have our work cut out for us, um, but these are the kinds of analyses that will make it possible to forge movements for sustainability that not only avoid the pitfalls of racism, colonialism, and authoritarianism, but actively work to counter those forces. So now I'd like to invite all three panelists to join us um, in the, um, you know, in uh, join us for the uh, Q and A. We have um, questions that have come in, and I'm going to um, read them, trying to balance them out among the uh, the different uh, speakers. Uh, please do continue to post your questions for all three speakers on the web form, and we'll continue to gather and organize them so that all three panelists have an opportunity to address the issues raised by the audience. Um, and I'd like to start then, uh, this is a question that came in for um, all the panelists or any of you who would like to address it. Um, and the uh, person asks, capitalists bear most of the blame for climate change, but many progressives have argued that we have no choice but to try to reform our existing capitalist institutions. That is that we can't hope to overcome capitalism in the few short years that we have to stop greenhouse gas emissions. For instance, in a recent book co-authored with UMass economist Robert Polin, radical scholar Noam Chomsky argues that, quote, global warming basically has to be taken care of within the framework of exi existing institutions. Do you agree? And what are the implications for how we confront the climate crisis? Who'd like to start? Jump right in. Well, I just, you know, I'll just start by saying that I think that we need um, we need responses at multiple levels. And so um, I don't, you know, see capitalism disappearing anytime really soon. So we're going to have to work within these frameworks, but also continue to imagine how we can, um, you know, you know, just thinking of Katya's re remarks around disaster capitalism, like, you know, how we have to think uh, more creatively about how to deal with these disasters, right? Um, because of, uh, because otherwise we're gonna be continuing these cycles, right? It's, it, we're never really gonna be addressing the root, the root causes of the problem. So I do think we'll have to address these issues on multiple fronts. Thank you. Katya or John, would you like to chime in? Um, 
this is such a tough question. And I don't, I, I'm not going to essay to essay to give a final answer to it, but one um, piece of work that's uh, helped me process things, process some of these things in a new way is one that's debated a lot. It's called, um, it's by uh, Kate Aronoff and colleagues. It's called A Planet to Win, Why We Need a Green New Deal. And they're grappling with exactly these questions. What to do when we have a lot of reasons to not like what's going on in capitalism and we want to transcend it, but we're also not sure that in the immediate term uh, we're going to be able to do so. And they argue that the approach is to like, really change institutions within a system of capitalism such that it's not the same capitalism as before. That's not going to be satisfying to everybody. And we've seen, especially again from um, uh, Dr. Aviles Vasquez's uh, presentation, that there are things that are intrinsic to capitalism that are that, that that tend to really fight both socially just and environmentally sustainable solutions. Um, and so it's a tall order to see where the Green New Deals can get us at least as far as we need to go to avoid immediate immediate difficulty. I would just add to what um, Rajani and John mentioned that when we discuss that reform, part of what we're reforming is precisely the system that is creating the problem, which has already been stated, but also who survives. And, and it's something that within the resiliency debate of being more resilient to climate disasters, well, resiliency is for those that survive. So when we're choosing, we are literally choosing who lives and who dies. And I think that's that's the power of gods, right? And how do we manage that power within academia and even at the grassroots level? I definitely, I couldn't agree more with Rajani about we are gonna need all the strategies at the same time. Definitely, we cannot afford to not create a different structure that can then supplant capitalism, but also shift it from inside while we're trying to survive. So thank you for that question. That was, that was an intense one to begin with. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't we didn't start off easy, I suppose, huh? Um, so the next question is specifically for Rajani. Uh, you warned us about the dangers of alarmism when discussing climate refugees, the danger of unwittingly reinforcing the racist, eco-fascist narrative about refugees flooding across national borders. But isn't it undeniable that there will be a massive increase in human displacement from climate disasters in the decades to come? And won't many of those displaced people need to seek refuge in rich countries like the US? By stressing the magnitude of the climate crisis and the increased displacement it will cause, can we in fact help move people to take action against climate change and psychologically prepare them to be more welcoming toward refugees? I, I mean, I would agree that I think we do need to, um, to prepare ourselves for, um, for more refugees and, and, and psychologically, just as you mentioned, I think that's a, a really good strategy. That's quite a different strategy than just um, using, you know, hate as a motivation, like to keep ref, you know, refugees or any immigrants out. Um, uh, but I would say that, you know, it's important to understand also that there are, you know, very complex cause, causes um, for any kinds of um, immigration and in terms of movements that are that take place because of climate issues and most of those movements have occurred uh, to a large extent within borders so i think that there is a way that this idea of like massive uh, numbers of um, climate refugees coming to the north is is an exaggerated um, you know kind of discourse that keeps getting repeated over and over and over again. And there's a lot more nuance and complexity to the way uh, displacements occur that we need to pay attention to. Thank you for that. Um, this uh, next question is for Katya. Uh, what are some models for disaster recovery that don't feed into the problem of disaster capitalism? Have any nations or organizations approached this successfully? I cannot speak for nations, but definitely from the example that we have been living through in the past five years, um, and part of the reason why I mentioned the Centros de Apoyo Mutuo, Ofrané, what has been going on is that nuclei of power have, have been the areas of resistance within our countries and were able to actually kind of grow out the network of support 
where there was a void from the state or the government structure that we expected to have it. Even, for example, the town of Utuado, which was militarily completely caught up months after the hurricane. The Centro de Apoyo Mutuo in Utuado, Camp Milares, Camp Bartolo, este Organización Boricua, and Cucina, all of them were able then to distribute goods. And that's part of the reason also very important that whether it is after a disaster, actually bypassing the state and not going through either certain kind of parachute nonprofits and certain government structures, but go directly to those grassroots organizations that are doing the work. And definitely Ofrané in the area of Honduras is one that has been doing that work. Like I mentioned, Centros de Apoyo Mutuo. And the, the idea is to have sustainable centers of power. So I don't know if that's um, something that has been seen as much in the US or in developed countries. I would love to hear from John or Rajani, but at least in Latin America, it's, it's a lot more common because of that um, vacuum of power that the government structure usually leaves for people to just disappear. John or Rajani, do you want to respond or? Um, just really briefly, I mean, that reminds me a bit of uh, the, the various examples that Dorothy Solnit uh, uh, write, writes about in, um, in um, uh, A Paradise Built in Hell, where in many different uh, disaster contexts, right, what initially happens is that, you know, is that as hierarchies are blown away, people initially come together in mutual aid. Now, the question of what happens next is really important, right? Because that's when the state and capital, after they, after after things start to settle out, start to come in and reestablish hierarchies, and that's when, uh, when a lot of difficulties start to start to ensue. So I, I feel like the seeds of that are present in a lot of different places, of course, to different extents. I would just add that um, you know I I don't know the names of particular organizations but you know we heard of course in the aftermath of hurricane katrina there were many different kinds of um very interesting efforts of community communities reaching across um you know the kinds of things that kept them apart in order to provide mutual aid to, to each other and and to sort of come up with uh new ways to 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 recover from those disasters so there are examples. Uh, I wish I could uh, give you some more concrete ones. That that's great to start with for sure. Um, a question for uh, John. Um, oh, I'm cho choosing which of these. There there are there are several interesting questions here. Um, I'll start with uh, why does the moniker authoritarian attach so much more readily to China than to our own governments in Western political discourse? Is there danger in labeling Chinese practices authoritarian, but not using the same term for what capitalists and their governments do? Um, yes, there is. And that's why I draw on, um, on uh, Marlies Glazier's definition of authoritarianism, which is not linked specific, it, which, is, which is not about systems or regimes, but rather is about practices. And so it's it's worth noting that constitutionally, China is set up formally as a system. You know, its political system is set up intentionally as one that is authoritarian, where the state makes decisions. Though it's worth noting, um, there's a really fascinating and important theory of a mass line and of connections of of connections between the state, the party, and the masses. Um, whereas in of uh, in, in liberal regimes. Things are set up such that there is at least formally, inten intentionally, a kind of accountability of the state to the people, and you know, and that is often as far as many people go, and that's why you see exactly that kind of uh, the, the kind of uh, uh, situation that uh, is rightly raised as a concern. But when of when officials in a liberal or democratic regime suppress accountability. Um, then they are acting in authoritarian ways, and we should call them out on that. And but we should also think about what are the differences across different situations in the manners and extents of 
of of accountability and and its suppression. The avenues o open for p for civil society actors for people who are oppressed in China are different from those that are that are open in the United States. And responding to either of those kinds of uh, situations of repression uh, demands being attentive to those kinds of situations. And furthermore, I appreciate the the, the questioner's note about uh, uh, about authoritarian, specifically cap capitalist practices, right? Because one of the things about capitalism is there are many pa very powerful actors who are shielded almost entirely from accountability except mm -hmm. through consumer actions. And so that is also a situation which in this definition would, uh, would, would uh, be thought of as authoritarian. Thank you for that. So uh, this, this is for Rajani now. I'm, I'm getting an echo. Is it okay for you all? Is mine? Okay. Um, you mentioned the Sierra Club. It seems that since that time, uh, they've taken a dramatic turn to acknowledge and reject their anti-immigration past. How much hope should we draw from this turnaround? How much can we expect others to shift their ecological thinking to one that can pursue sustainability and conservation while engaging actively in anti-racist work? I think this is incredibly hopeful, um, and it is. Um, it was something that was very much struggled for, and and, and so it's not by accident um, that the Sierra Club um, is um, really thinking about these issues in, in a way um, that you know really wants to highlight um, you know their past racist you know racism you know essentially, um, and and I think that. Um, we we need to really think about any kind of environmentalism it needs to have a very explicit anti-racist focus um, in in order for us to you know work around these issues. I mean, it, it has to be very much explicit. Otherwise, we can't just assume you know that it's there. Thank you. Um, the next question is for um, both uh, uh, Rajani and Katya. Um, Dr. Aviles talked about the disaster capitalism and disaster colonialism, but only briefly mentioned people leaving Puerto Rico. Um, Dr. Batia talked about not succumbing to refugee alarmism, but putting those two analyses together, the question is not whether there will be climate refugees or simply refuting the exaggerated numbers, but rather why there are climate refugees, what are the causes that drive people to leave? i.e. U.S. economic policy toward Latin America is the drive, primary driving force behind refugees who come here to escape the destruction we have wrecked to, the, to our South. Would love to hear both these fabulous scholars address this question. I, I mean, I, I'm just going to, I agree. This was, that was a great comment and I just want to underline it and support it. That was great. Yeah, I don't have anything to add. Definitely a wonderful comment and they tie into each other. It, it feeds up on each other and that's why it's so important to have a complete integral, integrated and comprehensive analysis rather than piecemeal looking at the receiving end or the sending part of the problem. Okay, I'm looking through. Um, and so this one is for John. In the current climate of Sinophobia, how can we critique environmental authoritarianism in China without feeding prejudice against China? Um, and also, uh, how can we critique um, environmental authoritarianism without feeding prejudice against socialism as well? Oh my, <laughs> that, is, that is the struggle. Um, and I think this, the struggle is very difficult as there are real things to be concerned about in China, just as there are real things to be concerned about in the United States and many other locales. Um, and I think the challenge, I mean, this is, this is, there are analogous challenges in any struggle in a complicated world, right? Where there are many actors that are, that are working uh, against many issues and in a lot of cross purposes. And I must admit that I am more or less reduced to um, 
responding in these generalities because this is tough and a thing that I'm frankly still working on and learning from the many people uh, within, uh, from, and beyond China um, who are fighting for justice for people within China and beyond um, in solidarity with people fighting for justice in Puerto Rico, in the United States, in other places. Um, so I'll stop there. I still need to learn on this question. And also one last thing I do want to correct myself. I mistakenly mentioned Rebecca Solnit as Dorothy Solnit. Her name is Rebecca Solnit. My apologies. Thank you for that um, and for, for, for the, the great answer to the question um, as well. Um, so we are almost at time and I'd just like to ask each of the panelists um, for final thoughts. Is there something that you'd uh, like the audience to come away with or anything that you'd like to underscore um, in the conversation that we've had? Um, why don't we um, start with Katya? Excellent. Well, I. All I have to say is that this was a perfect pairing, or it's not a pair, it's actually a three, but it was a perfect coming together of the ideas. And I think what we talked about in the previous comment of looking at this in a comprehensive manner, and like Rajan, Rajani already said, addressing it at different levels and with different strategies is gonna be crucial for us to move forward and definitely keeping that hope. And I think what John mentioned about bringing in that the book about um a planet to win that's actually there's there's been a lot of work that's documenting not only what's going on on the ground but then the building up or scaling up of different movements that are building towards a more just ecological future for everyone and one in which not just some people get to survive so i think kind of reminding ourselves of that hope and reminding each other of that hope is going to be really important and making sure that we're always thinking of it from a comprehensive approach while still working on our little pieces of land. So thank you for this invitation. It's been a pleasure. Thank you so much, Katya. Rajani? Sure. And I would just add that, um, you know, I think it's incredibly important as we center um, uh, environmental justice perspectives to do so in a way that is a transnational. We really need to work, you know, build transnational solidarity on these issues, um, especially, you know, within the United States where we often um, are just oblivious to what's happening around the world. I mean, I think we need to really think more and, and, and work more um, to build connections around these issues transnationally. Great, thank you. And John, final comments? Um, after this is over, I will probably come back. I'll be eager that the for the recording to come out so I can once again watch Katya's and Rajani's uh, presentations uh, because there's so much to be learned from them. And I think listening uh, to these and many of the other voices that uh, the right, again, like echoing what both of you just said, um, thinking about environmental justice transnationally and as the fundamental value that we should all be working for is really important. Wonderful. Well, thank you, all three of you, so much. Again, just a very rich conversation, uh, such excellent presentations. And you know, my only regret is that we didn't have more time um, to get to all of the questions that came in and to um, you know, really uh, be able to extend this conversation further. But we, uh, we know each other now, and um, the audience uh, knows who you all are, and I'm sure this will be sparking a lot of good conversation and good work um, as we strive for um, a more sustainable future through solidarity. Um, so I will next. No se maravilla con las bellezas de Puerto Rico. No se maravilla de que Puerto Rico es alegre, de que nos gusta fiestar. Pero al ver en María, entonces nosotros pudimos ver los jodidos que estábamos. El verdadero desastre vino después. Más de 5.000 personas fallecieron por la inacción precisamente del gobierno. 
new investors are coming to Puerto Rico, people that want to protect their wealth. Government services should be privatized and put in your hands because you can make money doing it. El gobierno que parece que no le importa la economía en la que tú tienes que sobrevivir. Entonces, no, no, no es justo. Ten mucho cuidado con cómo usted me está hablando, amigo. Usted es un hombre blanco y está en mi terreno. Como un denominador es el bienestar común. Si la gente se sentirse vulnerable, pues ¿qué van a hacer? Después de María dijimos, ¿sabes qué no? Soy yo para decirle a un joven, no cojas un adoquín cuando quizás se le murió su abuela por falta de esta gente. ¡Esto no se va a acabar! Este era el huracán que teníamos estacionado en el centro del pecho. ¿Es ahora o nunca? Yo quiero vivir esta isla como se supone que la podamos vivir. Nuestra. told by our father that they settled here long time. We know the boundaries by the old four pipes, by the mountain. We consider this place to be our land. If I lost this land, it's going to be loss of people and their history, culture and memory, and so loss of everything. For us to know where we're going, it's better to know where we come from. Acquisition of land over the years has favored the elites. Successive governments will give out logging concessions without any prior information to the communities. They will wake up in the morning and see loggers roll into the villages with bulldozers and chainsaws. Development depends upon knowing who owns what, and at the moment in Liberia, that's very difficult. The war affected every fabric of the Liberian society. Historical records were destroyed. The museums were looted. Most of the oral historians were killed. So you have a country without knowledge of their past. As long as we begin to address those issues, it will not be such a time bomb. But if we leave them undone, it will explode. How can we send your children to school now? We don't have no land. The government is not talking anything about it. Everything we have is gone. Whenever you are denied what rightly belongs to you, you don't sit down and sing hallelujah. You take a tactical retreat, and at some point in time, you strike. When you talk about life, you talk about land. Without the land, you cannot make it. Okay, thank you all so much for sticking around to watch these two trailers. Um, the first was um, from the film Landfall, which is available um, to be watched through the Feinberg series through tomorrow, March 5th. Um, this is an exquisite and deeply human film on post-Hurricane Maria, Puerto Rico, which touches on many of the themes that we've addressed today, including disaster capitalism, colonialism, and collective resistance. And then later this month, we'll be screening The Land Beneath Our Feet, which is on corporate land grabs and ongoing life-threatening disputes over land in Liberia. And that was the second trailer um, that you just saw. So I hope that you will take this opportunity to see these excellent films and to keep thinking about the connections to all the themes that we uh, were talking about today. Thank you all so much and good night.